Hi, my name is Tammy Pazaricki. I own Pleasant Trees Adult Day and Consulting Services in Marlboro. And I'm a certified Alzheimer's disease and dementia care trainer, a certified first responder dementia trainer, and a certified dementia practitioner. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how I proceed and do training with first responders. Um, it is so important for first responders to understand Alzheimer's and other dementias, and most importantly, how to communicate with an individual with that disease. Um, as, as part of the dementia-friendly community movement, we are well underway to training our local communities to be more dementia friendly. What, what does that mean? That means that we're going to remove the stigma of dementia, get people more engaged in their community and out of isolation, and help someone who might be wandering the street and can't find their way home. There are some simple things to understand. So for today, my focus is on the police department. Okay, um, my hope is that you're going to get a better understanding of Alzheimer's. I'm sure that you know someone with the disease, and if you don't, you may one day soon. Um, first, I want to start off with just some simple facts and, and statistics and let you know that there is an actual epidemic of Alzheimer's disease in our country. So the, it is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. One in three seniors dies with a dementia disease process. Alzheimer's affects all races, cultures, countries. It's non-discriminating. And now we're seeing with the baby boomers growing, um, the, the epidemic is, is really increasing to where we're seeing Alzheimer's younger. So no longer are we looking for a, a person in their 80s and 90s. They could be in their 50s and 60s. Over 5.4 million Americans live with this disease. It's important that you know that Alzheimer's and dementia is not a normal part of aging. There are cultures out there that actually believe that to be true. And there are cultures out there that actually believe that dementia is, is a punishment in some way. But the fact is that your risk of getting Alzheimer's, the biggest risk, is our age. The older we get, the closer we are to developing Alzheimer's disease. Every five years over the age of 65, our risk doubles. At the age of 85, you have a 50-50% chance of getting it. If you reach 95 and do not have dementia, you most likely will not develop it. If you have a first degree relative with the disease, yes, your risk goes up. There are many, many genes associated with all three ways of getting dementia, Alzheimer's disease. We're gonna, you're gonna learn that dementia is not a diagnosis. When I say Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is the most common of all the dementia diseases, okay? Um, the, your risk is higher if you are African American or Hispanic. And the reason for that is there's a higher prevalence of high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, heart issues. And really, our brain health is connected to our heart health and our physical health. So really, the only way to ward this disease off is by good prevention. And good prevention means living a healthy lifestyle, getting sleep, exercise, not smoking, moderate drinking, and, and eating a healthy diet. And those are really the only ways that we can help to prevent. But no one really knows who's going to end up with this disease. Normal aging versus dementia. Dementia, as I said, is not a diagnosis. It is a set of symptoms. So normal aging, sure, it takes uh, your recall isn't as great. 
It takes longer periods of time and less distraction to learn new things. You may forget a part of an experience, but when you're talking lady, you remember it. You may misplace your keys, but you're able to utilize what we call cognitive mapping and retrace your steps to find those keys. Someone with dementia struggles with that as they lose their ability with cognitive mapping. Someone with dementia starts to develop memory issues, short-term memory first, then long-term memory second. Um, they're confused to time and place. They may have poor judgment. Poor hygiene is another sign. And that you may know someone and all of a sudden, you know, you find that bills are piling up, not being paid. Um, they're starting to look disheveled and not taking good care of themselves. They're starting to forget appointments. Things like that, any concerns that might look like dementia really need to be addressed and they need to be worked up for a diagnosis. So what we look for is a diagnosis to support the dementia sy symptoms. There are reversible causes of dementia. Reversible causes like infection, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, metabolic issues, endocrine issues, untreated depression is one of them, um, vitamin deficiency, nutritional deficit, brain tumors, those can all be treated. So we wanna make sure that it is an actual, non-reversible dementia disease process. And all of these are different fatal neurological diseases that cause dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common, but there's Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal lobe, Creutzfeldt Jakob, um, there's a, a number of them. But it's very, very important to get a diagnosis because it could be reversible and treatable. What I want to talk about too is what happens? What are some of the symptoms of dementia and what, what can be caused? One is delusions and hallucinations. These are things that first responders may have to deal with, but it's very different dealing with a delusion and a hallucination with someone who has a mental illness and someone who has a dementia disease process. A delusion being just a false belief. A hallucination being a false perce sensory perception. So they're actually seeing something, hearing something that is not true and not there. But there are behaviors or what I like to call unwanted communication that can come out of delusions and hallucinations because they believe whatever they believe and you cannot just talk someone out of their delusion or hallucination. The next thing to know about is sundowning. Sundowning is a phenomenon that occurs with any dementia disease process. Some people we see in it more than in others. Um, but what happens is it occurs at the end of the day and what we know about it is that it's when the sun goes down. The lights are, it's, it's a lot darker, it's grayer. They do get more confused. They get more disoriented. They get scared. And I can attribute it to some fatigue as well. They've had a long day, they're tired, they're worn out. They're not at their highest level of functioning. And at sundowning time, that is really when we see, uh, we can see an increase in wandering. We see an increase of shadowing, which is what we see when the person with dementia attaches themselves to the hip of the, of the caregiver because they just don't know what the next step in their day is going to be. And they're not feeling safe and secure. And we want to be able to instill that with, with them. And how do we do that as first responders? to someone who has a delusion or hallucination, is feeling unsafe, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And this training is shortened to about 20, 25 minutes from what is normally a two hour training. So I'm not gonna go too much in depth in this, but it's gonna give you some real good basic ideas of what to do. 
The next thing to know about is wandering. Um, the nice thing about our towns, our surrounding towns of Hudson, Northborough, Marlboro, we actually have a registry with our police departments that keeps track of those people who are in our community dealing with the disease and are at risk for getting lost out in our community. The thing of, to understand about wandering is that the person always has a goal in mind. Their goal is that they have to go to work. They have to pick the kids up off the school bus. They have to do something. And in their mind, that means them leaving. It may, it may be worse if they're taking their car. Um, their cognitive mapping is declining. And unfortunately, what happens with folks that are still driving is that they may be able to get from point A to point B and point C, no problem. And I hear it all the time where families will say, well, my mom only goes to the grocery store and the bank and home, and she knows the route by heart. What happens with a detour sign? And they reroute your mom off of the path that she knows. That's when it becomes a problem. Or when they get to a place and they can't make their way back. But the thing to understand is that you may be looking at an individual in the community wandering the parking lot um, who's in their 50s and 60s, can't find their car. Maybe that person has dementia and that's why they can't find their car. Or you may be in a store and the person's trying to check out and he's really struggling with the task of checking out. You know, what we're doing behind Dementia Friendly is we're really trying to educate the community on what we can do to recognize and help these individuals with dementia. Folks that are wandering are not going to ask for help. They may be not dressed appropriately for the weather. So, um, I know for, for a person from my program was found downtown Hudson in the middle of winter in her robe, slippers, and um, walker. And she found her way from her apartment down to the center of town. So that's someone who you would automatically look at and say, wow, that's not, she must be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So these are the things that you want to be aware of and approaching them, and you're gonna learn strategies on how to approach them to help them. So knowing one thing about Alzheimer's disease is that what remains. So the memory's going, um, their judgment's poor, they're confused at times, but they are able to feel. Feel emotions like you and I, happy, sad, mad, angry, frustrated, all the things that we can feel, they feel. The problem is, is that sometimes they can't communicate those feelings. And that goes back to my term, unwanted communication. Sometimes we see the behaviors happen, but it's really their only way of communicating to, to us. Maybe it's an unmet need or an unmet want. Maybe it might be a basic need that's not being fulfilled. They're able to pick up on our emotion too. They read body language. They know how we're feeling. And sometimes that will mirror back. So what I always educate caregivers to do is leave your problems on the side. Um, and when you go to approach someone with dementia, it's very warmly and with a smile. The dominant feelings of someone with Alzheimer's this is what they feel all day long, 24 seven. And the job of caregivers is to help them to feel needed, useful, purposeful, happy. And that's how I educate healthcare providers as well. That that's how our job, we all have a purpose to get up in the morning and we want them to have that same purpose. There are communication changes that happen with an individual with Alzheimer's. The word finding difficulty. Um, they may become, with some types of dementia, they may have some inability to control what they say. So filters are going away. So their social graces aren't as good. 
Um, I had a woman who uh, had frontotemporal lobe dementia and her biggest thing was stealing from a store. And of course, the police were called to come in. Um, but with a first responder who's educated to know how to approach this person, that to see the signs that this person has dementia and to understand it, that it's not criminal behavior, it's her own ability um, to communicate with whatever signs and symptoms of dementia she has. So we see um, a lack of empathy on their part. Uh, sometimes we see more of an obsessive compulsive component to some of the dementia symptoms. But it's important that we understand how they're able to communicate and how we have to communicate. With first responders, this three-step process is huge. It's called validate, empathize, and redirect. Redirect meaning we want to get them removed from the, the situation. The situation might be harmful, distressful, um, and we want them to focus on something different. With a person with Alzheimer's, you can't just go up to them and redirect them and their focus on something else. You have to become a trusted ally. You have to become their friend. Um, this happens during when they're having a delusion, a hallucination, any unwanted communication that's affecting us to do our job. The main thing is to learn how to communicate. We're gonna go through some strategies, but validation. When we are talking as human beings, we all wanna be validated, we all wanna be heard. And empathy, meaning I wanna hear that you understand how I feel. A person with dementia hears that validation, feels that empathy, and now you can come in and attempt the redirection to something more positive. These are some strategies. Smile, as I said, the biggest way you're gonna open the door and window to communication because we all smile in the same language. When you're approaching someone with dementia, you wanna approach them from the front, not startle them from the back or the side, calmly, um, friendly, with patience and flexibility, introducing yourself. First responders, I always say, have it a little easier because you're wearing the uniform. You're wearing the uniform that conveys that trust. And so I, it's almost as if you, you know, you already have a good platform to work on to be able to communicate with someone with Alzheimer's. We want to listen. I tell my caregivers in all my classes that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Because in order for us to be a good detective with someone with Alzheimer's and understand what's going on, we have got to listen and, and open up our eyes to what we're seeing the person trying to convey. Showing patience, support, not rushing them. When we rush someone with dementia, you're just going to advance the unwanted communication. Um, we want to, at all costs, try to reduce um, the use of restraint and force. And as police officers, you are trained to be demanding and commanding when it's warranted and to use restraint and force when it's warranted. And in the case of a person with Alzheimer's, unless, let's just say this, last resort, restraint and force. Um, fiblets. Fiblets are very good and useful. They are a therapeutic tool, let's say. A fiblet is a therapeutic non-truth. It is not a lie, I don't call it a lie, but it is a non-truth that helps to remove that person from their anxiety and stress in the moment, okay? So for example, I had a gentleman in my day program every afternoon around sundowning would ask for his mother. And when he would ask for his mother, because I'm educated, 
I would then say, Arthur, your mother is at the beauty parlor. When she's done getting her hair done, she'll be by to pick you up. While we wait for her, would you mind helping me fold these towels? Now, if I had said, Arthur, what are you crazy? Your mother died 30 years ago. That would absolutely crush him. I would have just then thrown him back to the very first moment he heard that his mother died and he would have to regrieve that all over again. People who don't understand the disease and don't know about communication skills actually cause the negative, negative feelings in that person. Um, so using those therapeutic fiblets when they're believable while you're trying to gain the trust of that person. You're going to join them in their reality. They also teach police officers, gee, if they're delusional and, hallucin and hallucinatory, we're going to try and get them out of it. With dementia, we want to just join them, jump in, get in their reality, and then save the day. A woman at home thinks there's a man in her house that's going to kill her um, and you're there to, to check it out. Well, using all these strategies, walking her hand in hand to each room or if need be, having her go to the hospital and saying you're going to save the day by taking her to a safe place and getting her away from here. So it's not arguing. It's not confronting, it's validating, empathizing, and redirecting. And it all, we want to always focus on the level of danger. Are they in harm's way? Um, and always offer praise and recognition. Praise for someone who, with Alzheimer's or dementia, they crave that. They don't hear that anymore. They don't get praise or recognition. They feel useless. And when we can offer a compliment, um, that does a lot of good in that person. The benefits to good communication, we're validating their feelings, we're enhancing their self-esteem, and we're giving them a sense of reassurance. So good communication equals you've now become a partner with them. They trust you. And we're going to diffuse power struggles because we've utilized good communication with them. Catastrophic reaction, this is why we use good communication because once their um, unwanted communication gets to a level of a catastrophic reaction, meaning it's a complete out of proportion reaction to what's really going on because they've worked themselves up so much without getting validated, without getting empathy, and no one understanding that the catastrophic reaction is really difficult to backpedal from. Um, the barriers to good communication, speaking too quickly, being commanding and demanding, um, asking too many questions or difficult questions. If you are trying to talk with someone with Alzheimer's, you want to make sure there's not a lot of other distractions. Sirens, uh, pagers going off, TVs blaring. You want to make sure that that person is focused on you. With dementia, they lose their sense of hearing and vision. All sensory systems diminish. So we want to remove any outside distractions. I want to thank you for watching this video and it's been my pleasure to train you um, and I hope to be able to come in person and, and give you a full training. Thank you.